The Tale of the Alligator Wrestler. Alligators are prehistoric. When I say I mean that, they are remained they have remained the same since creation. However long ago that might be, they were designed to survive through all trials and tribulations of the earth. Alligators are apex predators. However, they are afraid of one thing, that is man. We are not on the list of prey items. However, if the alligator is big enough and the person is small enough, like a small child, then the alligator will become opportunistic and therefore give it a try. Alligators spend majority of their time reserving energy for when they need it. Alligators are found in the southeastern United States with the greatest populations found in Louisiana and Florida, as well as Texas. Those are the most tolerable climates for reptiles in the New World. Today, in Florida, I believe there is an estimated 1.6 million alligators. In 1973, alligators were listed as endangered as they were overhunted and poached for the leather and fashion products that they produce, as well as the meat. Alligators do have a particular taste that is a delicacy. I, re I recommend trying it. Alligators actually came off the endangered species list in 1987, just a couple years before I was born. Protecting the alligators by having alligator farms was the best thing that happened for them. When there were no places to get alligator products, their hide and meat became a black market item at high price. Once alligators farm, alligator farms came into the mix, they would mass produce alligators and provide the public with the hide and meat needs, taking them off the black market and lowering the value of poaching them. Alligators can reach lengths of 14 foot plus and upwards of a ton in weight. That would be an extremely large and healthy alligator. This is a rarity these days. To see a 12 foot alligator is not uncommon, but anything bigger is becoming less and less common. There are reports of alligators that are bigger, but not on record, nor very believable. If you ever seen, if you have ever seen an alligator bigger than 13 foot, you would understand. I knew of an alligator that was 13 foot, nine inches, and weighed in at 1,700 pounds. He was enormous, and there were not many animals that existed he could not find to be a prey item. So any bigger would not even benefit an alligator, because any bigger than that, it would barely be able to move or hunt, being how slow it would be make them. 60% of alligators' diet are fish. Everything else is opportunistic. Birds, raccoons, possums, foxes, otters, turtles, hogs, and sometimes deer. I will bet most of you don't know why alligators are one of the most important living creatures of the Everglades. Some would call them the lifeblood to the Everglades. You see, there are really only two seasons here in the Everglades. We have wet and dry season. Our wet season is from May through December. Our dry season starts in December and ends in April or May when summer starts. Alligators eat only about 40 times a year. There is about a 12 week window that is just too cold for them to digest food given that they are ectothermic, meaning they are cold blooded and rely on environmental heat sources such as the sun to operate to an economical metabolic rate to digest food. So during the dry season, it tends to be the colder months where the environmental heat sources are just not very prevalent. The importance of the alligator, however, is during the wet season. The bigger alligators tend to find or design themselves an alligator hole. The Everglades is a floodplain zone, very low elevations, so about 80% of land will go underwater naturally during the wet season. Alligators will find the lowest elevation they can and wallow it out. If the fish have the areas that have the areas they normally swim in, they will normally well, then other areas flood, they will make their way in the now flooded areas. Interestingly, alligators don't see that well underneath water. In fact, they do not see any better than we do. They have three eyelids, one like ours that goes up and down. They have one like our socket, so when they close their eyes after grabbing prey, it is hard for the said prey to kick out or poke their eyes. However, still possible. It is just extra protection. The third is the nictitating membrane. This eyelid goes side to side and usually is used like goggles underneath water, keeping dirt and debris out. 
of their eyes. However, the muck and mud, most waters low visibility and almost none. None, knowing this, would would tell you that alligators are not good hunters underwater. So back to the said gator holes. Alligators wallow this out, this hole, so that all the fish swimming in the flooded areas during wet season will at least the alligators are hoping at least the alligators are hoping will not make it back to the deeper waters. They will be trapped in their wallowed out hole. Therefore, as dry season comes, it is as smorgasbord sushi buffet the alligator has plenty of food to last him through dry season besides feeding the alligator the importance of this is this the hole the alligator wallows out will be one of the last places in the dry season to have water eventually so all the surrounding animals will use it to get use the gator hole as a water source allowing the alligator to be opportunistic and take what he can get that comes for a drink, making the alligator very important to survival for everything. Even the birds use the alligator for survival. A lot of herons and egrets will nest in trees above alligators knowing that they can't climb the trees but are protection from animals who can, like raccoons and possums which would raise and nest if they weren't for the alligator guarding his pond. Alligators are typically only designed to eat things no bigger than their mouth. They tend to swallow things in one bite rather than tear pieces, making that a big difference between them and crocodiles. Do you know any differences between an alligator and a crocodile? One will see you later and the other will see you in a while. One is spelled with an A and one is spelled with a C. No, I'm just kidding. Alligators have up to 80 teeth, whereas crocodiles about 60. When an alligator's mouth is shut, you tend to only see the top jaw teeth pointing down. Crocodiles' teeth sort of intersect each other and are sharper. Crocodiles being like this so that they most more are easily can tear off pieces, allowing them to take down more larger prey items. Still able to do the same things as alligators, just better equipped to handle larger animals than they encounter. Think of Africa, for example. There are antelope, zebras, and bison who migrate, and if crocodiles were not designed by God the way they are, then they would have a hard time taking down such large animals. So therefore, making crocodiles more dangerous. Even through, even though we are not a natural prey item, crocodiles would have an easier time taking a full-grown adult down as an opp opportune food item. Now that we have covered some facts about alligators and crocodiles, let's get into the subject of alligator wrestling. A little history lesson without getting too in-depth, maybe the next video. During the time period of 1816 and 1858, there were three Seminole Indian Wars. Originally, the Seminoles were different tribes of natives that band together calling themselves Seminole, meaning runaway. The natives were pushed by the American government from north to the unexplored south like the Everglades. Very difficult terrain, not to mention the mosquitoes. The Seminoles had to learn how to survive in the Florida swamps and stay out of sight from the American government. John Tyler and Andrew Jackson, presidents you may know, were the ones involved in trying to remove the Native Americans from the land so they could develop on the land. While pushed down into the swamps, the Seminoles stayed hidden for many years, battling capture from the American government. They hunted the native wildlife, learned to fish and gig for gar and frogs. They even wanted, hunted the alligator. A man would leave camp and sometimes be gone for three days from his family by himself. If he encountered an alligator, he would have to find a way to capture it alive. He did not want to kill it, as the meat would spoil before he returned. The Florida heat would expedite the rigor mortis decaying process. So over time, techniques were developed to do so and capture the alligator by themselves and carry them home to feed their family. The Seminoles did this to some survive and stay from being captured by the American government. The Seminoles have become the only tribe to never sign a peace treaty with the American government, making them the unconquered tribe. Later, in time, reservations were set up by the American government for Seminoles to live without the state laws governing but federal laws governing the land. American tourists were able to pass through these reservations. Oftentimes, Seminoles would have displays of beautiful pottery, beadwork, and native patchwork set up for sale. 
To entice the tourists, you would oftentimes see a seminal on an alligator doing tricks to get tourists to buy their pottery, beadwork, and patchwork so that they could feed their family, and eventually tourists would tip the Native American on the alligator to do more tricks. Between the wars and drainage of the swamp missions by the Army Corps of Engineers, Seminole's land still became a tourist attraction. While a man by the name of Henry Coppinger Jr. grew up in, a Flor in Florida where his dad was hired by Flagler who owned the Royal Palm Hotel and plenty of land. His dad, Coppinger Sr., was hired to design the landscape of several of Flagler's resorts and 10-acre estates that became Coppinger's tropical gardens. This is where Henry Coppinger Jr. grew up stalking and catching alligators. In 1917, a freeze killed the gardens, opened the door for the Seminoles. Someone suggested to Coppinger that he should have a Seminole camp as an attraction. In early January 1918, the tourist came camp featured young Henry Coppinger as Alligator Boy wrestling shows. This caused the tourism dollars to flow during the 1930s, making the Seminole Villages at this time the state's leading vacation attractions. There were Seminoles doing with Henry Coppinger doing shows, along with Henry Coppinger. It was at one time called Man vs. Beast, later to be known as Alligator Wrestling. To this day, the tradition is known as a free-handed technique of catching an alligator and is done by many people. I know including some women to make money from tourists to feed their family and also to educate people about alligators. In recent years, there are now a freestyle alligator and wrestling competition where fellow alligator wrestlers compete by displaying each individual's technique of capturing an alligator safely without getting bit. At least that's the hope. I have been an alligator wrestler in more of these competitions than anyone else. I have never won one of them, but that's a story of politics. I'm humbled to just be involved, whether I win or lose. Not getting chomped on or even if it last in last place is still a win to me. As of this past Friday the 13th, I am now 31 and I have been an alligator wrestler for 13 years. I lived outside at one time not known to wear shoes, slept on a cot next to an alligator pit, several actually, and wrestled alligators to survive. It is scary, and one mistake can ruin your life or kill you. You must have and be full of spirit and be spiritual. You must believe in a greater power than yourself. If you don't, you will not last long without getting severely injured. Alligators may not see us as something they want to eat, but they will defend themselves. You must be of sober mind and pay attention fully and never do it when the spirit tells you not to. If you don't listen, then that will be it for you. I have been bit one time and I could not be more proud of how minor and almost nothing of a bite. Keep watching and you will see. Why did I choose to wrestle alligators? Animal handling is gen generally a sort of Cho cho generally so chose me. I think I might have been two years old before my dad left to get a pack of cigarettes and never came back. Before he left, he brought to me to a place where there is an alligator named Elvis. I found that alligator now, and he is still alive and over 13 foot. I don't remember when I was two, but it must have stuck with me in such a way. By the time I was four, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. It was an autoimmune disease that caused my immune system to be low and my white blood cells to be so super high, causing inflammation in all my joints. I regularly felt excruciating pain, pain as if I had broken all my bones all the time. I had to crawl to the bathroom for several years. I was on every medication known to man to manage the pain. However, even on steroids and chemotherapy, I would still have occasional flare-ups. I also had many other side effects from medicating medication and was always sick and throwing up. Not many people know this, but I was so desperate to feel like a normal kid. I was depressed and a loner and in severe pain. I did middle school in bed on a phone because I could not get out of bed. I did not know God or Jesus, but I always felt the presence which I have come to know as the Spirit. I dreamed of being like Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter. Little did I know what, I, what was to come. By the age of 14, I was on injections of medications called methotrexate, embryo, and prednisone. 
I hated my life and couldn't bear the pain anymore. While one day my mother was at work, I took all my medication and threw it down the drain. The shots of methotrexate and embryo, my mom slowly weaned me off without the doctor's knowledge. I got sicker for a while, but I'd rather get sick and die than to stay on these medications any longer. Of course, I didn't die, but by the grace of God, I was healed by his hand. I have pain still to this day, but I will always endure the pain before I go back to being treated with medication for only one length of time. I started to be like a normal kid, got in trouble, went into a private school, but still managed to do normal things. However, I got a job at a reptile store where I cleaned reptile kids with poop and took out trash. Shortly after I started working at the reptile store, I truly found my passion. A car accident with my best friend almost ended it all. I was driving to a college party while we were juniors and flipped my car several times hitting three trees. My best friend was in a coma for six days. I had broken my neck, fractured my back in two places, bruised my lungs, lacerated my spleen, broke four ribs, broke my collarbone, broke my clavicle, broke my cheek, a couple teeth were shattered, my trunk hit me in the head, and I had a hematoma on my brain, and 11 staples to put my head back together. I was lucky to be alive, needless to say. The accident happened July 10th, 2006. I attended my first Daytona Reptile show in August 2006, a month later. I had a neck brace on and no pain medications. I realized then God had some kind of plan for me. It wasn't too many months later I turned 18 and on my 18th birthday, I handled venomous snakes after I legally signed a waiver that I could do so. Before a few months, I had over 500 hours of handling cobras, rattlesnakes, and different vipers. You needed a thousand hours then to be able to apply for a license to get them as pets. I soon applied for a job at Billy Swamp Safari. I had never seen an airboat or heard of a swamp buggy, but I got the job and traveled 60 miles one way every day for three years to work minus the days I didn't leave and slept in a cheeky that had no electricity. It was a beautiful place for an 18 year old boy who was lost and had no direction in 2007. A week after I started, an alligator got loose from its enclosure that I was being trained to clean on cleaning. I guess my response wasn't the typical responses. Without training, I jumped on my first alligator and pinned it down in the bushes while help was coming. That alligator was nine foot long, over 200 pounds. I made friends after that with the alligator wrestler there at the time. His name was John Martinez. He has passed away since then, but he taught me how to respect alligators, how to catch them, and taught me the basic fundamentals on how not to get bit. I was not employed long enough to be allowed to wrestle alligators, but I helped catch them. It wasn't but a year later, the first alligator wrestling competition ever happened in the beginning of 2009. I had been catching alligators and handling them since 2007. Wrestling them was different, more dangerous. The first competition was wild alligators they caught just for the event, and they dropped one in a six foot deep pool where we had to go down and capture it and bring it on land. I thought I would get to watch other wrestlers go before me and do it. I ended up going second. Billy Walker of Seminole went first, but he drew such a small alligator, it was not much to learn from, very basic. I drew an eight and a half foot alligator and had no idea what to do. I tried different methods and almost got bit and nearly drowned. By the protection of Archangel Michael, I dragged that alligator out of the pool by its mouth made the newspaper and became an alligator wrestler from then on. I never gave up, always believed in myself, and found God. That is the conclusion of success, or the concoction of success. I hope to one day have my own TV show, just like Steve Irwin, The Crocodile Hunter. So to support, you can start by liking this video and subscribing below. Thanks for watching and listening to the tale of the alligator wrestler.